let's dive in. Um, you know, we'll just our quick announcements before we dive too far. Our next webinar on August 10th. First, we'll feature the return of Katie Ilton, who's coming back from maternity leave. Steve and I couldn't be happier. So the brains of the operation will return, and she's going to be one of the lawyers. We're going to do grab bag, which is, I, I think Steve calls it, what, what is, how do you refer to grab bag? I'm not sure what you're thinking of, but it is my favorite topic. It's, our, it's definitely the best thing we do. Uh, and so we will cover everything from, like, new HIPAA guidance, uh, new opiate guidance, some big court cases, and then the questions that we get asked all of the time. So it'll be a, a mishmash, an hour of mishmash. Remember, sound sometimes goes to heck in a handbasket. Robert is sending out the number you can dial in if the internet slows down. Unfortunately, we can't do anything about that. We don't control the internet. Um, and then last but not least, our past webinars, and this, this webinar, are all available online. This one will be up in about 24 hours or so. Uh, if you go to fredlaw.com and just Google or I'm sorry, search in there, health law webinars, all of our past webinars are up. So we are going to dig through value-based healthcare today, and it's going to be more of a 30,000-foot level. Um, I'm going to start off talking a little bit about some of the MIPS stuff, and there's breaking MIPS news, and actually I forgot, printed it off and then forgot to bring it down, but just today the acting administrator at CMS has said that they are open to propose to uh, delaying MACRA. Um, but we'll talk more about that in a second. Steve's going to give a bunch of wisdom, uh, and then I'm going to very quickly talk about CJR. We have a whole webinar about that, so that will be fa fa fast. First, let's do a little quiz. So I'm going to put two pictures up. It's going to seem like almost an eye test. So we've got Storm 1. So some of you know I'm uh, storm chasing is my hobby. So that's picture 1. Here's picture 2. And the question is, which of these two pictures is more menacing? Which would you be more scared of? This picture or that picture. So um, both of these are pictures from southern Minnesota from a few years ago. So and if you asked, I think most people, they would choose this guy because it looks sort of scary. That looks like a tornado. Um, the truth is that one, while menacing looking at, wasn't rotating. That's just a, either scud or a low-hanging uh, kind of wall cloud. It's a little hard to tell, but it was not a tornado. It did not drop a tornado, nothing bad. On this one, if you look sort of real low down here, uh, right there, uh, just above the mirror and where the cursor is pointing, you can see debris on the ground. There's actually a tornado in this picture. And what it, I'm showing the storm chasing picture, A, because I'm geeky and I like to do it, but B, this is a good metaphor for what we're going to talk about. The details matter, and looking really closely at stuff matters. I think Steve and I would both describe ourselves as big picture people, um, and mostly because I think we think we're crappy at the details, we would say sometimes in a self-deprecating fashion. But the truth is we like to dig in and find out what's going on at the bottom. And in this area, the digging in is key. Um, in fact, we will co come up with several examples of where failure to dig in can undo everything you do at the 30,000 foot level. So first, on the macro level, it, you know, in, if you're still doing housework, you know that predictions about the future aren't always accurate. You know, the Jetsons told us that by now we were going to have robots and nothing was going to happen. And the death of fee-for-service has been predicted since I was a, a, in college in the 80s. I was a health policy person. And fee-for-service was going away. At that point, it was going to be capitation and HMOs, and there was no more fee-for-service. And here we are, you know, 30 years later, and there's still very much fee-for-service. I think this is different. I. I did not believe capitation was going to catch on, and I didn't think capitation was going to catch on because I don't think anyone wants their doctor to get paid to not treat them. I think that's an unpopular mechanism. And so I've never been a th never believed capitation was going to become the way of the world in the U.S. This feels different to me, and maybe I'm just getting older and less cynical. But I know when Steve just rolled his eyes at the less cynical. Um, but I think that people want to shift the payment, and I think that the ideas that they're coming up with here are less scary than capitation, and so I think this is going to catch on. Now, remember, quality has an allure to it that's a little terrifying, and I would like to pay for quality. I just want to note this is one of the places where the details matter. So we're going to pay people on quality, and what that often means is that if you're a doctor and X percentage of your patients smoke, you're a bad doctor. Well, 
that's crazy. You don't have control over that. If anything, if the only way you could control that factor for real is fire all of your patients who smoke. You can certainly encourage people to go to non to smoking cessation programs, but you can't make them. Another common quality metric is the percentage of your patients whose blood pressure is controlled. And I would say the same thing. Patient compliance is not something that is 100% within the doctor's control. It seems fine to me to measure whether a doctor is encouraging a patient to be compliant. You may even want to have some metric that requires the doctor to document that he or she is making patients try to be compliant. But the actual compliance, that sort of outcomes measure, and I worked at InterStudy back in the 80s and we were all talking about outcomes then, but it seems to me foisting an outcomes measure on the doctor is terribly unfair. And then finally, I wanna go with one of my favorites of all time, which is a health plan that ranked doctors on keeping patients safe. And you may wonder what keeping patients safe was. You might speculate that it had something to do with walking patients to the parking lot. It didn't. It was the percentage of safe generic medications that were prescribed by the doctors. And that's what the test was, but the criteria as it appeared in the report that was mailed to all of this health plan's beneficiaries was whether you were keeping patients safe. And I mention all of this to say, to emphasize a theme that we're both going to be on, the devil is in the details. I think that's right. You know, a lot of people have been talking about this recently in the context of uh, uh, quality measures that are based on um, the patient experience and patient surveys. And a lot of people would say, well, the patient survey doesn't really necessarily have anything to do with the patient's health. It has to do with whether they like the carpeting. Uh, and so I think there's a long way to go in trying to figure out how to define quality. And that's, you see in the title, we're going to talk about dirty bathrooms. That'll be coming up. But stuff like that is often what's measured in the current world as quality. All right, so I'm going to do just some quick stuff about MIPS. Um, you know, remember, CMS has goals. They want to have 30% of all payments tied to quality and value through alternative payment um, and 85% tied to quality or value. And so the difference between those two is whether it's through an alternative payment or to quality and value. So MIPS, where we're going to take a fee-for-service payment and then adjust it, isn't an alternative payment. It's a payment that is a regular payment tied to quality. Um, and they want by 2018 to have 90% of all payments have some quality component. And, you know, MIPS, if it happens, and I, it statutorily kind of has to, is going to do this with all of the Part B payments. Now, where are we at? Well, there's a proposed rule that's issued on May 9th. The comment period ended at the end of June. The thing's long. It's 500 pages long. I put the site here if you want to read the whole thing. Darn, it is hard to slot. I, okay, confession, I have not read it all for two reasons. One, it's 500 pages. But, like, I read all, most, almost all of CJR. Um, this, is, this is different because it, um, it's a proposed rule and it, it, it is going to change. All right, that's one thing we know is it will not, what we're going to talk about right now is not what's going to happen. CMS is talking about the possibility that they will delay the effective date. Um, and I, I bet that that'll happen because Congress is all worked up about this and they're worried in particular about whether small physicians are going to be able to handle it. So what the idea of MIPS is that it's going to replace the programs that are out there right now, the Physician Quality Reporting Program, the Value-Based Payment Modifier, and the uh, EHR Incentive Program go away. Um, the program introduces a whole bunch of uh, acronyms, including MIPS, which is the Merit-Based Incentive Payment System. Um, it's often called, I think, often people think that M is for Medicare, but it's merit-based incentive payment. Um, it talks about alternative payment models, which are APMs. Another term we're going to hear bantied about is EP, which is not a record album. It's an eligible professional. Um, MACRA, of course, stands for the Medicare Access and CHIP, which is Children's Health Insurance Program Reauthorization Act. So it's great when your acronyms uh, consist of sub-acronyms. Um, another two acronyms that get banging around a lot, PFPM, Physician Focused Payment Models, CMS likes to use that. And then there is a lot of talk about qualified clinical data registries. So this is just a touch of the list. One of the cool things about the proposed rule is that the second page of it has a list of all the acronyms. Um, it's not bad to keep that handy. So in the alternative payment model world, CMS is talking about a very limited subset of things. So there are four things that they currently, four buckets that they would say qualify as an APM. 
So it's something that comes out of the center, uh, um, CMS's Innovation Center model, the Medicare Shades Shared Savings Program, if you're in a demonstration under the Quality Demonstration Program, or some other demonstration that's required by federal law. And if you're in one of these APMs under the proposed rule, and remember it's only proposed, you get favorable scoring. Um, and in fact, if you're in an advanced APM, which is very narrowly defined, you'll get out of MIPS. Um, and you're wondering if why we're not digging into the details, and the answer is because I don't think the details matter yet because it's only a proposed rule. Um, the, so to, to be an advanced APM, though, you need to require certified EHR technicians. And you have to base payment on a quality measure, so it's got to be something that's sort of MIPS-like. And they're very detailed. We're going to talk a little teeny bit about the CJR program, which is a, a reimbursement program. Some would call it a bundling program. I would not for joint replacement. That program, despite the fact that it's pretty revolutionary and makes hospitals responsible for an entire package of care, doesn't qualify as an advanced APM under the proposed rule. And I think that is causing a bunch of outcry and might be one of the things that changes. So under the proposed rule, which would start January 1, 2017, um, at least the data part. So this is a kind of a weird thing. They'll start gathering data under the proposed rule on January 1st of next year for payments that kick in in 2019. So MIPS only applies to physicians, osteopaths, dentists, physician assistants, nurse practitioners, clinical nurse specialists, and CRNAs in that first year. In the third year, physical and occupational ther therapists, speech language pathologists, audiologists, midwives, clinical social workers, psychologists, and dietitians get added in. Um, note, this does not apply to hospitals. It applies to professionals, not things, not facilities, not nursing homes. In the first year, if, you're, if it's your first year in Medicare Part B, you won't be included. If you only have 100 Medicare patients, you won't be uh, included. And if you, uh, uh, if you had less than like $10,000 in receipts from Medicare, and then some APM people. And, that's, and I guess I should be clear, I should, everything in here is, may not be included, because remember, it's a proposed rule. But big picture, here's what's going on. Payments will be adjusted up or down by 4% in 2019, increasing to 9% by 2022. So this is your regular Medicare fee for scheduled payment. You could get a bonus or a loss of up to 9% six years in the future. And that's actually misleading because the program has to be budget neutral. And so uh, uh, CMS is expecting way more people will get whacked than get a bonus. And so there's the possibility of having up to three times the projected upside. So you, in theory, could get a bonus of 27% if you shoot the lights out on metrics. Um, but that would be premised on A, a lot of people getting whacked, and then B, you shooting the lights out. This is set up, you can participate individually as a doctor, but if you're a group, you can do it under your group TIN, and CMS is setting up the idea that currently unaffiliated practitioners may be able to band together in some sort of um, virtual group. So in year one, your payments will be based on four buckets, and it changes. So these metrics or the, per the, the percentage makeup changes under the proposal each year. So half of it is on the quality, 10% is on resource use, which is really cost, 15% is on clinical practice improvement activities, which we might call quality, and then advanced care information, which you might think of as uh, electronic medical records, are 25%. And I'm just gonna quickly walk you through how some of thing, these things go. So the quality measures is a list. And if you look in the Federal Register, there are like 90 pages of quality measures. And this is like a choose your own adventure from when you're a kid. You can pick six measures. You have to pick them in advance, but you pick, then pick the six and that's what you get measured off of. It's a little more complicated than that because there are a few you must includes in there, um, but you basically get to, in theory, will probably get to choose your measures. I just put one example, this is a copy out of the Federal Register, and so this particular um, metric out of the Minnesota Community Measurement was for asthma control. And you know, you'd look at patients age five to 50 um, whose asthma is well controlled as demonstrated by one of three age-appropriate patient reported outcomes. And so you look at your specialty and they, they break these apart by specialty and you have to pick measures um, and that's how, it, and you'll get scored points for making those measures. 
Resource use is going to be calculated entirely off of claims data, and they're going to look at costs per capita, capita that are attributable to Medicare beneficiaries and then have some adjustments. And then they're then basically going to rank you to other people, and you'll get a point score, and you'll get something, you know, something's going to happen with this. Talk about the devil in the details. Someone, you know, is going to be doing a lot of work to try to help people understand what this means. I would love to say that's me. It's not going to be me. Um, it's, this is going to be hard, and it's going to be overwhelming for a lot of people. And I think that's one of the things that's scaring the socks off of people is you don't understand how you're going to come out on this. The clinical practice improvement, um, so it's care coordination, shared decision making. You get 90 choices, so it's overwhelming. They've talked about the paradox of choice. This is the paradox of choice on steroids. Um, if you can become a patient-centered medical home, that would take care of under the proposed rule being clinical practice improvement. And we're, like, we're doing this pretty quickly because it's only proposed. If there's ever a final rule, um, we will then get into this in a more meaningful way. Finally, advanced care information, which is formerly known as, when I look at FKA, I always think it's something obscene. Um, but what used to be meaningful use is gone under this proposal. And instead, um, you're, it, you'll get paid for a kind of a more global use of electronic information. But CMS says, we recognize that as EHR becomes the norm, this significance of advanced care information will fall from the 25% to some lower number. This highlights that in a proposed rule, things are confusing. This is right out of the proposed rule. There are 50 base points and 80 performance points plus one bonus point, which gives you a total of 100 points. Um, way to go, CMS. Uh, so. Similarly, there's a composite performance score. So they take all of your criteria and may convert them into points, and you get adjustments for things like if you're small or if you're rural. Um, there are going to be different sets of rules if you're a non-patient-facing practice, and that would be something like radiology. Um, even anesthesia can be considered non-patient-facing. People who don't really see, even though anesthesia, I guess, on some level does, you know, can do pre-surgical clearances, but they're, I think, for this purpose, probably considered non-patient facing. There are clearly kinks to be worked out. So there's going to be a performance threshold, which is defined as the 25th quartile of possible values. Um, those of you who remember your high school math, there are only four quartiles. You could be the 25th percentile. You cannot be the 25th quartile. Um, I put this picture in just because it's pretty, basically. Uh, but if, also, if you look, there are three tornadoes on the ground in this one. Um, and uh, really, it was just a, a setup to transition to Steve, who's going to be uh, three, smarter than me. <clears throat> this is uh, not about three tornadoes, uh, but it's, uh, I guess the first slide indicates a lot of tornadoes. So uh, lots of folks out there, because uh, Medicare has gotten serious about this, uh, developing complicated uh, systems for population and health payment and, and uh, combining quality and a number of other factors. and how they pay, lots of people are saying, well, we need to react to this. And they are creating inside their organizations groups of people that are dedicated to developing the organization's solution to uh, concerns uh, for population health payment models. And they're uh, starting to go down the path. Some of them are quite a ways down the path in developing the organization's solution. And many of them are saying to themselves, well, uh, in order to uh, work on uh, maximizing our payment from Medicare uh, or uh, Medicaid, uh, perhaps uh, under a state law proposal uh, authority, or with private payers, we can't uh, just work by ourselves. We need to get together. We need to create network arrangements um, that will contract um, or participate in a program uh, to get special payment under uh, one of these approaches. And uh, people, I think, that have started down this path uh, see something like this from their lawyers, all the governmental rules that may apply to what they're trying to do as a network. And there's a huge host of them. It's more than three tornadoes. There are rules that come out of the specific governmental models, like MSSP rules and MIPS rules. Um, there are the old standbys, Stark and I kickback. Uh, there is the concern that if we are getting together with our competitors, we may have some kind of antitrust arrangement or, or a conspiracy that we've created. 
Uh, they are, there is, if we are a tax-exempt organization like many hospitals, a uh, concern that we will blow our tax exemption if we're participating in some kind of for-profit venture with for-profit partners. Uh, there is the uh, concern that we might be looked at as an insurance company and be subject to insurance regulation by our state. Um, there's the concern that we are going to be sharing all kinds of data and information uh, with other participants in our network, and so we'll be subjected to HIPAA rules. And, and I'm just, the insurance regulation one is such a weird one. I remember when I first heard it, but there was a theory for quite a while, and some states still have it, that if you take a capitated payment, if you're at risk, you know, risk is is like being an insurer. And so that's it's a strange idea, but it's out there. Right. There are the PIP rules, which uh, also regulate how physicians can uh, be given uh, compensation deals that put them at risk and limitations on how much risk they can take and when reinsurance has to kick in. So what often happens as these conversations gin up uh, to put together the network is that a lawyer uh, puts all of these uh, tornadoes on a piece of paper and everybody looks at them and says, well, let's, let's go forward and hope that the debris doesn't start to hit us. And in fact, that's probably the right thing to do because the practical things that you're dealing with when you put together the network are different from this uh, giant uh, list of uh, legal regulatory concerns. <clears throat> the biggest problem that you have is putting together documents. Uh, there are, uh, is an entity that you form. The entity is rather simple. And then there is a network of contracts that you put together. And the network of contracts is incredibly tricky. Uh, I would say, and I, I say it in the bottom of this slide, uh, the biggest source of legal complication for anybody putting together a network of participating providers to do value-based uh, uh, work is the contracts it signs with the payers. The payers uh, put together something that's pretty lengthy, uh, much more uh, significant than it has been in, in past years, much more specific, uh, and uh, you have to comply with that contract. So when you put together participant agreements in your network, you've got to be aware of what is in the, uh, the network's agreement with payers that it is trying to deal with. Now, there are all kinds of things that can be in those upstream agreements that are the source of the majority of, uh, of your concern. First thing, the payer contract probably contains a representation that the network has the authority to bind the participants. Uh, and when it says that it has the authority to bind the participants, it's to bind it to everything in the network contract and probably to things that are in the uh, protocols and policies and manuals that the uh, payer puts out. And, and uh, that's something that networks frequently don't think about very much when they put together their contracts with the participants. Second, uh, if if you have a network where the participants can opt out, that may conflict with the representation that you've made to the payer, right? The payer thinks that you've got a, a, a given uh, provider panel. And, uh, and if the uh, participants can opt out or can terminate in the middle of the year, that changes how everything works. Um, <clears throat> sometimes the provider, the, the payer contract actually has some rep representations about how the network is going to operate or how the network is going to make distributions. They may uh, require you to say, this is our plan for uh, how we're going to share whatever is the uh, joint payment that comes out from the payer. And in fact, that's true of the applications that you make for the, uh, uh, some of the Medicare shared services plans and so on. Um, there are some other kind of tricky things that happen in the upstream agreements. Um, sometimes the agreements contain uh, distributions from the payer that are discretionary and that don't uh, have very cl clearly defined terms. If that's the case, it's hard for you to be able to be clear with the members of your network about what they're going to get. Um, uh, it's uh, much preferable if you can put together something that is uh, um, maybe long and complex, but describes what you're going to get from the payer if you partic uh, participate in a, and, and uh, succeed in a certain measurable way. I'm going to just interject one quick point, which is I think since I started practicing, something has changed. It is much more common now for us to have a situation where someone calls us with a problem 
and it turns out they're stuck because of something that's in a written agreement than it was when I started. And I think part of that is people, I, I believe, are less likely to have read all of the agreements and to have had a lawyer read all of the agreements. Um, and you know, I can think of one example in the Medicare Advantage world where people have called us and said, hey, we're being required to do this compliance training. David, is it legally required? And the answer is it's not legally required, but if you look at your contract, you agreed to it. Um, and that's going to happen even more, I predict, in this world because these agreements are complicated and no one wants to read them. So I'm just reinforcing Steve's point. I think that's right. You know, the other one of the other things that's happened in the, the development of these payment models is that uh, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, we weren't uh, using attribution models. We weren't attributing lives to a particular network or set of uh, providers. Um, one of the things that we've seen in the past is uh, a provider that participates in two different networks, and both networks uh, are attributing lives to that provider so that the payer doesn't have a clear understanding of who, which uh, network is supposed to pay uh, for a given set of lives. Um, really complicated uh, when attribution is added, and it probably uh, is something that needs to be dealt with in both the upstream contract that you sign with the payer so that you deal with that potential problem, and also the downstream uh, uh, contract. Uh, another thing uh, that you see sometimes in upstream contracts is a requirement for the network to obtain authorizations uh, for uh, sharing of patient information. Lots of networks really don't have the ability to do that and don't do it. Um, you've got to be careful about signing an agreement that tells you you've got to do something that you don't actually have any ability to do. Same thing with audit obligations. You see in the upstream contracts lots of time that, that the payer has the ability to audit um, if you are uh, saying to them that you are binding the uh, network uh, uh, providers to an obligation that allows them to be audited by the payer, they may find that very surprising and may resist, and you may not be complying with that thing. So uh, the upstream ag stream agreement is complicated. You want a network that puts together one of these things, would like to get uh, a, a, an upstream agreement, an agreement with the payers, that it negotiates heavily on the language, not just negotiating on the dollars. And, and uh, people spend a lot of their time trying to understand how the dollars work, and so uh, it's, it's very uh, frequent for them to say that's the whole negotiation. And uh, with any kind of arrangement where you are dealing with a network that you've created, it's, it's about ten times more important that you uh, bring in folks to negotiate the language and make sure that you are uh, committing to, uh, to things that you're able to commit to, uh, to the payer. So bottom line here, the details, back to our details big picture theme, you know, you can, can hear from listening to Steve talk about this. He's thought about this stuff a lot. And there's this weird interaction between the details and the big picture. The, the details can prevent you from getting your big picture. Here, or make it really painful. So the downstream participation agreement is the agreement that the network signs with all of the network providers. And uh, I, I think what I've seen from, of these agreements is that they are based on a model that was created 20 years ago for PHOs and uh, uh, some other sort of so net physician hospital organization. Right, networks that were put together in local settings. And if you look at those agreements, they are not very long. Uh, they probably say something like the uh, uh, network participant is going to uh, uh, um, comply with all of the rules that are handed down by the, uh, um, by the network. Uh, they probably say uh, that uh, it's non-exclusive, uh, that you can be in whatever network you want. They probably say, in many cases, uh, you can opt out of uh, whatever arrangement you don't like. And, and uh, as physician hospital organizations went out years ago to do this work, they said, well, we need to be able to provide an agreement that uh, will be acceptable both to uh, the primary care group down the street and to a super specialty group that we think is important to have in our network. And, and one of those groups would say, we will absolutely not do uh, uh, exclusivity and we absolutely uh, won't um, 
um, agree to any deal you set, we want to have the ability to opt out. Another group would have maybe said, uh, well, we'll take something that's a little tighter. Uh, but th those agreements, those loosey-goosey agreements, are exactly the thing that is difficult to uh, uh, make sync up with the upstream agreement. Um, uh, it is probably important to, uh, to pay a lot of attention to that thing and to, um, to be really careful about what you're sending out. It may be that more than one form of agreement is necessary. Some uh, people have tiers of, uh, of uh, downstream participation agreements. Tier one is tighter than tier two, uh, but also may contain uh, more benefits than tier two. Um, uh, and, and then there's a bunch of issues that you need to look at. Number one, does the downstream participant agreeing to everything in the upstream contract? If that's true, you probably need that downstream participant to see the upstream contract, every one of them. Um, and have some ability to, you know, you know, to not only see it, but really affirmatively opt in. Or this is back to Steve's point. If you, if you can't opt out, you're stuck with it, whatever it says. Right. And it may be that that's something that's going to be required. It's a big complication to have people opt out, and right. it's certainly a big complication for them to terminate a product in the middle of the agreement. But uh, if you're putting together a network newly, you're probably going to have to have something that, uh, that isn't very tight. Um, well, what about future changes to the arrangement? Do, do, are they agreeing at point A, and then we change the agreement six months down the road or a year down the road? Do they have to continue to comply? Probably important to think about that. Uh, for each tier of participant in the arrangement, do you want to make it applicable, make, make future changes uh, required for folks? How easy or hard is it for the participant to get out of the arrangement? Again, in the beginning, it may be that you can't sell it if the people can't get out of it. But uh, as you get more arrangements, as it gets more complicated, as there are more requirements coming down from the payers, as they become more sophisticated in designing the models, participants departing screws everything up. So uh, it may be that, that uh, this is a process that's going to require a beginning point and then amendment in the future to tighten the agreement, uh, maybe to make it harder for it to get out. What happens if somebody leaves, terminates the agreement in the middle? Every agreement has a termination provision, and most of these are going to have a termination that can be done on a number of days. If in 120 days I can terminate the agreement, how do I participate in the uh, bonus that's offered to everybody under the shared savings plan? Is there a calculation that's set out in the agreement? Do we put that in a separate manual? That's something that really needs to be thought about best if it's thought about in advance before you go talk to people who are potential participants. And obviously that works both ways, too. If you're the person who's put out by the plan, you know, right at the end of the year, are you getting your bonus? You know, it, it's a... It's really, that, 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 there are going to be big fights about some of that stuff. Yeah, and, and we're seeing these uh, little fights uh, popping up and becoming uh, big legal conversations. Everybody is interested in uh, participating in these things, and people don't want to spoil the relationship with their partners. Uh, so sometimes they're uh, friendly uh, disputes, but they can quickly turn into to unfriendly disputes. There's a sequencing issue here, and, and it, it really is uh, that the network typically starts out with a, uh, a, a participant agreement for its members. It puts together an entity and then it puts together provider agreements before it goes to the payers. So it isn't obvious what needs to be in the provider agreement because you don't know what you're committing to with the payers. And so this is why we have a lot of these out of sync sets of agreements that are created in networks. Uh, we, we start at point A with our sort of vanilla model participant agreement and then we go to the payers and the payers say, well, we've got uh, uh, program A that we're interested in providing and program B and it requires uh, A, B, and C. And, and uh, um, now, we all know the, the practical uh, uh, implications of having a strong agreement. You've got to prove that there's a reason for it. I'm going to skip that one because I really already did it. Um, 
talking a little bit about financial structures, and I'm going to refer back a bit to the big list of legal problems here. Um, some of them are uh, really bonus-oriented, or they're bonus and loss-oriented. That means that uh, we've put together a network. We know that all the participants in the network have a contract with the payer, and we're using a mathematical model to say how much uh, cost or how much cost savings has happened in a given time period for a given population, either assigned or attributed. And if you have uh, this result, you get a bonus or, or a loss. Um, those uh, agreements are uh, much less uh, uh, legally risky. They're much easier to implement than the uh, ones that are described in C, the ones where uh, uh, you're actually setting forth a full risk arrangement or a capitation arrangement. Um, the reason for that is that in the shared savings bonus or loss context, you're really not negotiating the price, the main price that the uh, uh, payer is paying to your participating members. You're really only negotiating an increment to the price. And that says to me that uh, the folks that are nervous about whether you have committed an antitrust violation, the, that means the government, will have a really hard time making a case, a really hard time making a case that shared savings bonuses that are jointly put together are a uh, conspiracy to set a price. We've all got a basic price under the contract. If you have a capitation arrangement, on the other hand, you're really saying, here's the total price that the payer pays for this thing. And that means that you're, you're jointly negotiating your base price. And that's something that's more difficult to do. Um, I believe that uh, this very fact, this one fact, is going to result in the vast majority of these contracts being some kind of innovative bonus or loss uh, and piggybacking on the underlying contracts that the, that the uh, uh, providers already have. Um, and uh, uh, I think it, it, the interesting thing about it is that economically, financially, it may not be very much different from capitation, right? Because even though you're at, you may be at full risk for capitation, your performance may not be a 50% loss. Your performance may be something that's similar to what happens under the shared savings deal. Um, so how do you get the participants to sign? Well, a lot of providers are only going to sign a non-exclusive upside-only deal. They say to themselves, we have no reason to believe that you can manage this. We have no reason to believe that uh, our provider group has the ability to really understand risk. So we'll participate. We want to be with you. Um, uh, we'll only sign a non-exclusive deal. We'll only ex uh, sign on an upside-only basis. I think that's going to be where almost all networks start. It may be that there are two categories of folks, um, some that are willing to take uh, risk and, and uh, some that are not, and that actually is going to uh, create a little bit of an issue for people. And I've heard lawyers argue about this. Uh, they say, well, if we're uh, subjecting ourselves to downside risk, is it possible for uh, some members of the network to take downside risk and others not to take downside risk? In particular, what if the hospital takes the downside risk and it, and it uh, puts together a network in which uh, the doctors are protected from downside risk? Is that okay? And that's a big philosophical argument for some people. I think that they, some of them think, well, the downside risk originates with the provider. And if the hospital takes uh, the downside risk but doesn't uh, send it on down to the doctors, that means that the hospital is remunerating those doctors or doing something that will uh, give a concern under the fraud and abuse or Stark rules. I think it's possible. I think that uh, the fraud and abuse and Stark rules are always in play if the contract between uh, uh, a, a prov one provider and another is unreasonable. And if we're in a network together and one of us uh, is very influential in that network and we put together something that is too sweet uh, for a participant, 
it's there's a risk that somebody says that that uh, Stark and anti-kickback are uh, are implicated. But I don't think it is automatically true that having somebody that doesn't take downside risk in your network creates that uh, a Stark and anti-kickback problem. And as I've tried to research it, I haven't found that conclusion. It is certainly true that if we put risk on somebody, if we put risk on a doctor and the risk is more than 25%, we're going to be, and it's for Medicare and Medicaid population, we're going to have to deal with the physician incentive plan rules, the so-called PIP rules, and those will require us to put reinsurance in place. So for Medicare, we will have some limitations on how much risk we can actually pass down. Um, and there may be state PIP requirements that are important too. Um, <clears throat> I think that most people, when they are distributing network earnings, are going to distribute them in proportion to payments. And I think this slide is really there to just sort of uh, follow up on the point I just made, that there might be stark and anti-kickback implications if a deal is too sweet. What about exclusivity? Um, uh, uh, there are some networks that are going to require exclusivity. Exclusivity is going to become very interesting in the context of uh, attribution models. And I gave a little bit of that anecdote earlier about two different uh, networks that had the same doctors in them, and both of them claimed uh, particular sets of lives, um, and nobody could figure out uh, how to attribute and pay the doctors correctly. Um, uh, that's the biggest driver that comes out of the, sort of the new way of doing things that leads people towards exclusivity. You should be aware that there are some states that pro prohibit or restrict exclusive arrangements. There's something like that in the Minnesota law that most people have ignored for a long time. Yeah, and actually I'm just going to interject there. This is the classic thing. People won't necessarily think to look, and if you decide to look, it could be hard to find. That's right. Um, how do we do care management? I think there's really only one thing I want to say. People haven't uh, uh, done much. There's not much in the law about what you can do to incent uh, behavior uh, among uh, patients uh, to try to get them to do something that uh, leads them in a low-cost direction. For Medicare, there's an OIG special advisory bulletin on gifts, and that's what people usually mostly look at. It's uh, leading you to this idea that maybe inexpensive gifts are okay. You have to be a little bit careful if there are financial incentives to try to lead people to do the right thing. I'm going to jump through a couple of things because I'm, I'm, uh, I want David to get back to another topic. But um, So I'm going to pass by state regulation insurance. It's a big deal. All right. He gave me a sign that said I can talk a little while longer. Um, <clears throat> clinical integration. Uh, people are interested in uh, clinical integration. You, uh, interestingly, you hear more about it than financial integration. Uh, clinical integration and financial integration are the uh, key elements, alternative key elements to uh, getting you out of a price fixing or other antitrust problem. Uh, if you have these things, uh, then you are treated by the antitrust authorities under the rule of reason. You're not a per se violator. Um, uh, clinical integration, it's unclear what it is. Uh, lots of networks uh, have a very small amount of it. Uh, lots of networks however, are entering into deals where they're accepting risk and sharing risk, and that's probably financial integration. Both of these things are going to be important, uh, I think, interestingly, in the future, and among other things, they're going to be important to data sharing. So uh, this is a fairly major uh, item. If you look at the HIPAA rules, and HIPAA, of course, is only one part of the a landscape of uh, data sharing restrictions, but the HIPAA rules say that you've got to get authorizations to share data. And of course, when we put together networks, one of the main things we're trying to do is learn from the behavior that everybody uh, has, uh, collect data, study it, and figure out what's a cheaper way to deliver uh, excellent service. And so uh, what's the problem that, that HIPAA has, forgetting for the moment the the other uh, sources of authority on this. Well, HIPAA says that you don't have to get an authorization for some certain kinds of, uh, of things. You, you're permitted without an authorization to uh, share uh, information related to the healthcare operations of your provider group, um, and that's useful. And interestingly, you can share it with another provider if 
it's important to the health care uh, operations of the receiving provider group. Well, uh, if, 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 if Dr. A has seen the patient, Dr. B hasn't seen the patient, uh, Dr. B shouldn't be sh getting that information even as part of a network. So the sharing of information within the network is uh, potentially uh, prohibited by HIPAA unless you've got an authorization that is adequate. Um, and that can be complicated, and it can be difficult to know that you've really got it. Um, you can deal with that effectively if you put together a, um, an organized health care arrangement, if you are an organized health care arrangement. Because an organized health care arrangement can share data for health care operations of itself. It isn't saying whose health care operations, the recipient or the the deliverer of information. It's healthcare or uh, uh, in, uh, <laughs> it's information relating to its uh, activities. Um, and so, what is an OCA, an organized healthcare arrangement? To put another uh, acronym out there. Well, it's a clinically integrated care setting. Okay, so there's that clinical integration word, or it's an organized system of healthcare in which more than one covered entity participates and in which the participating covered entities hold themselves out to the public as participating in a joint arrangement and then participate in these joint activities that look like managed care type activities. Um, it, it's hard to know whether every network is an organized healthcare arrangement. Every network is going to probably want to say that it is because it's going to want to say we have the ability to share information. It's important to share the information. So you're going to have to hold yourself out to the public as something. The name that you create isn't just a private name amongst yourselves. And uh, you know you, you need to say this is the joint provision of care. And you're going to need to do some utilization re review, some quality assessment and so on. Um, so, what's your strategy? For everybody that starts this, start small. Start with the idea that you, an idea that you can sell to the participants. Probably needs to be a non-exclusive deal. Might need to be set up so that it can migrate to be a more exclusive deal or one that's harder to opt out of. Um, you should work on the incentives, on the cost reduced, uh, uh, cost reduction incentives and make sure that they're compliant. Make sure that they don't create a fraud and abuse or stark problem. You should develop meaningful integration. It's a lot easier to do financial integration, easier to show it, than clinical integration. Um, you should try to figure out if there are risks and cover them with withholds and reinsurance. Uh, you should make the arrangement public and call it an OCA. Um, you should police the consent and authorization issue so you don't get in trouble. If you get in trouble with the government on HIPAA, you've got a huge problem. Um, you should negotiate contracts upstream and downstream that work together. And probably the downstream contracts are going to have to permit modification over time, and probably you're going to want to be able to do that somewhat unilaterally. Um, that's it. Oh, I can think of as I was the Oka Oka Cabana, but okay, my brain works <laughs> in mysterious ways. So I'm going to do this very quickly because we've got a whole webinar on CJR um, that was the the March webinar. So if you if you go to our website fredlaw.com and in the search box type uh, health health law webinars, you can watch an entire hour on this. I'm going to cover in ten minutes really to highlight a couple of big pictures. So first. Strategically, people talk about the CJR as a bundled payment. It's not, and, 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 and I, don't, I don't think it is at least. And so here's what it really is. Medicare is saying the hospital is going to be responsible for the cost of a, of a bundle of care that happens from admission to 90 days following discharge for almost everything that that patient incurs for Part A and Part B if they're one of in a knee or hip replacement. Um, but... The, the everyone continues to get paid a on their straight up fee for service and then the hospital is going to face the piper after a while on how those costs play out so the hospital gets a bonus or a penalty um, and then this is where this is one of the most important points we want to make the hospital's economic performance is moot if they don't meet certain patient satisfaction and outcome measures. And it's interesting, I don't hear that talked about enough. 
Um, and that's, we'll talk, that's where the bathroom comes into play. So here are the 67 metropolitan statistical areas. You can look at this slide at your, own, at your leisure and see if you're one of them. So they come up with a target price, which is a blend of hospital-specific and regional stuff, and then that moves over time. Um, then there are caps on how much you can lose, but if you see going out in year four and five, there can be 20% swings, all right? So giant sums of money we're talking about. Hospitals can, but needn't, incentivize other people to play. And this is one of the weird things. There, we're, I'm aware of at least a few private payers that are doing things like this, and they would not do it the way CMS is because the hospital takes all the risk but has absolutely no leverage. They can't make anyone do anything. The, a doctor can continue to act in a CJR location as they always have and get paid as they always have. And if their costs are high, the hospital will make less money. The doctor is not affected at all. So crazy, but that's the way it's set up. So in some ways, it's the antithesis of what Steve was just talking about here. Um, hospitals have risk and no leverage. The episode of care as defined here, I would say, is a way not to do it out there in the world. And one of the biggies, let's just say I go in for my hip replacement and then I am unfortunate enough to be diagnosed with a terminal lung cancer uh, three weeks later, and I go on hospice. So what do you think? Hospice care, hospital response, the hospital that did the joint replacement on me, responsible for my hospice care? The answer is yes. Um, let's say if as part of that hospice care, or let's, uh, I've got a drinking problem as well, and I choose that 90-day window to get treatment for it. Hospital that did my joint replacement responsible for my CD treatment? Yes. I mean, that is nuts, and it's in there. Um, and this is back to our theme again of the details matter, and you have to understand what stuff's going on. As a policy aside, I think that this is a, a sneaky way of rationing care. I think that what they're trying to do is say, don't do hip replacements on someone who needs other medical stuff. Now, CMS clearly disagrees, and in fact, they're saying you're not allowed to choose, you're not allowed to ration care or cherry pick your patients. But boy, they're sure as heck creating a major financial incentive to do so. All of those things are part of the episode of care. And so it really isn't a bundled payment, it's here are the costs that go into figuring out whether you've hit your target or not. Um, I. I'm going to do this very quickly because you can watch the whole webinar, but hospitals can't make patients. So this is, these are kinds of questions you'll want to ask in another deal. What can you tell patients? What, what rights do you have? Can you fire a patient who chooses to use an expensive vendor? For CJR, the answer is you, patients can't be required to use a particular therapist or SNF. It's less clear whether you could fire them. You arguably could. It's not crystal clear. Um, the hospital can't make a collaborator, the, the hospital can require a collaborator to sign a contract, it can't require anyone to be a, co a collaborator, and the hospital can't compel someone to take downside risk. That do you take downside risk or not is going to be one of the big questions in these deals. There are limits on how the risk can be shared under CJR, and one of the biggies is there's a cap. A doctor can't have an upside potential that exceeds 50% of the total Medicare physician fee schedule payment that the doctor got for providing services to CJR beneficiaries. Now, when this was written, I think that it was done in a hurry, in a giant hurry. Proposed rule came out in July, final rule in November. A bunch of really obvious questions are unanswered. What about private pay? Does it factor into this at all? I would say the answer to that is no. Um, and, but it raises an interesting question about, do you have, do, would you have a separate agreement? And I guess the answer to that is yes but you've got this cap of total payment. Can the hospital be making payments to the doctors for you know, shared savings slash gain sharing that's unrelated to CJR? And I would say the answer to that is yes, but if someone wanted to point to this and try to come up with an argument that the answer is no, they might be able to. And so we're in this weird territory of, of uncertainty. Um, all right, really gonna go, I just wanna make another point that applies broadly, and this is a, an area where I hear what I would say is bad information from other lawyers all the time. When you're setting up payments, there's often a question, can you have a long-term payment, and particularly in a gain-sharing deal? And a lot of lawyers look at various advisory opinions that are out there that talk about a deal that lasted one year. And they will say, you can only have a, 
a term of one year. And that analysis is flawed because there is an advisory opinion, 1222, that talked about a, a gain-sharing deal that was three years. And that proves that it is at least theoretically possible, it's, it's not even theoretical, it is actually possible to have more than a one-year deal and have it be legal. Um, and many lawyers out there are unaware of that. And so that's just a point in the back of your mind if you get into some deal and someone is saying it has to be one year. Um, so let's talk about bathrooms for a minute. It's a little bit of potty humor. I don't know where this, where this is going. So a thing that is key in CJR and that I have not heard talked about, in order to get paid as a hospital, actually I'm going to skip ahead for a slide, there are these various quality metrics. And you have to be in the bottom, I'm sorry, the top 70% in each of the two metrics to get your payment. Or put another way, if you're in the bottom 30% of either measure, you do not get your reconciliation payment even if you were otherwise due it, all right? So think about this mathematically. 30% of all hospitals are going to fail on each of the metrics. And if you fail on either, you don't get paid. Assuming it's not exactly the same 30% in either one, something like 40 or 50% of the hospitals in the country are going to hit their saving if they hit their savings targets, still will not get paid. So what are those metrics? Well, um, you know, there's a complication measure, which is do you have an MI or pneumonia or surgical bleeding site? That's sort of the medical stuff, and you have to figure out if that's fair. Um, you know, I'm not a doctor, but is every acute MI actually related to the surgery? Um, they, you know, whether they are or not, they're getting bucketed here, and then. There's 40% of your score is on the hospital consumer assessment of health providers and systems survey measure. The hookups? I don't know. I don't know what I want to do with that one. Um, and that's the patient satisfaction tool that looks at um, how clean was your bathroom, how quickly did nurses respond to the call button, um, uh, how good was your pain management. At least that one might have some doctor component, but there are other factors in there. So one of the things, you're a physician and you sign a deal with a hospital, you could do everything asked of you in your agreement and get zeroed out because of the hospital's dirty bathroom. And that lesson isn't just for CJR, it gets to why you really need to read these agreements because you may do your job and someone else in the system, higher up in the network or in the CJR thing, the hospital, prevents you from making the criteria. You know, in the network Steve's talking about, you do it, but your network doesn't meet the goal, and so there is no payment from to the network from the payer. And that stuff can happen, and you need to understand that detail. Um, so, I, you know, I think that this stuff is going to be out there. I think that we've got a tipping point going on. Um, in the CJR world, it's interesting that the hospitals can't control a lot of the costs that they're responsible for, even if they're integrated. Because you'd say, well, you could go go get the post-acute care, go get the therapists, then you can control those costs. True for the people you employ, but the patient is free to choose another vendor. So even if you buy up a bunch of ERFs and uh, uh, therapists, that doesn't mean the patient is necessarily going to go there. So I don't know that we've had a lot of questions in here. We may have, uh, um, but that that's kind of it. Um, this actually, it all comes back to Bruce in the flying saucer. So this was a picture from Delano of a supercell storm, and I did not think about it. This ties in beautifully. Uh, for those of you who are listening to our sound checks, you know, there's a UFO that the uh, International Space Station spotted. This is a uh, supercell thunderstorm that looks very flying saucer-esque. Um, so... Please fill out your evaluations. If you've got topics you want us to cover in a future webinar, let us know. The August 10th webinar grab bag. And so actually, if you've got questions that you think would be interesting to cover there, feel free, send me an email, um, dglazer at fredlaw.com. You can send Katie Hilton, you can send Steve Beck emails. We will, but uh, I would do me a favor in the subject line, put question for webinar, because that way we can search for them easily. Um, I think that uh, covers our real estate. Steve, am I missing anything? Nope. So thank you so much for joining us and have a lovely afternoon. Oh, happy Bastille Day Eve.